us no doubt have uh, read this story before. Many of us no doubt probably have had manger scenes in our houses at one time or t'other. And in all those cases we would have had three little figurines of men dressed in kind of funny hats and long robes carrying gifts. And we call them the three wise men or better rendered the magi. But I would like to suggest to you tonight that, that we, we tend to over-sentimentalize the Christmas story. And I think in the Magi, we often miss the reason that this story is actually in the Bible. Now, I'm not pretending to be the end-all and be-all of telling you all the reasons why God has certain stories in the Bible. But I would like to suggest this evening that there is at least one reason that I have discerned why this is here. There may be other reasons. God lives in a multi-complex set of uh, uh, standards. I mean, he's infinite, so he may have many reasons for putting this in here. But I have discerned at least one. And so I want to look at the lessons from the Magi, and I want to kind of go through this. I believe that here we have a picture of salvation, especially salvation of the Gentiles. So let me uh, uh, give you the three points, and then uh, if you're taking notes, or if you're not, it doesn't matter, it's it's on recording anyway. Uh, I'm going to give you the three points, and then we'll dive in. Number one, God is calling the nations extensively. That is, God is calling all the nations to himself. I find that in the text. Number two, or B, God reveals his truth to the nations publicly, And rationally, that is, God reveals his truth in Jesus Christ to all the world. It's not limited to just a select few. It's given so that all men can be exposed to it and that all men can believe. It's not hidden in a corner. Number three, God calls his people out of the nations humanly secretly, supernaturally, and efficaciously, which is simply a big word for powerfully. So we're going to look at those three points as we look at this story of the three wise men or the Magi. Now, I think you would agree that as we look at the Bible, although it seems at first to be a book about the Jews, The more we read it, the more we recognize that the Bible is really not about the Jews per se, but about all the nations. The question always is, well, why then the Jews? And the answer to that, I think, is very relatively simple, and you should understand this. The Jews were not granted intimacy with God and the law and the prophets and all the oracles and all the things they got to heap them upon themselves in a selfish manner. No, the Jews were given all these privileges by God so that they could be the fulcrum, the source of light that would go out to all the nations and to proclaim to them the truth of the gospel. That is to say, through the Jews came this uh, this uh, oracle called the Bible, the the Old Testament in specific, and through that and through their lineage came what we call the Messiah or Jesus or the one who would save the nations. So we can never look at the Bible as, well, that's a Jewish book and it's not for me. No, the Bible is a book that is about God drawing the nations to himself and using the Jews as the instrument to get the nation, uh, to get the gospel, or to get Christ to all the nations. And so, I want you to just see that in this story, the first thing you're confronted with as you're reading about the three wise men or the magi is that these men were not, in any sense of the word, Jews. They were not in the inner circle. They didn't have all the advantages that the Jews had. Now, the question, of course, is, or one of the questions, who are these guys? Well, there's a couple of things I think that we've, you know, we've kind of uh, twisted a little bit in our, our eagerness to sentimentalize Christmas. For, number one, we don't know that these men uh, were only three in number. It never says that. 
We don't know how many there were. It was at least two because it's plural, but it could have been two, 15, 20. We don't know. So that's the first thing. The second thing is it says they came from the east. Now most scholars, and I would be among them, say that they probably came from the area of Persia. The reason I say that is because in Persia we had uh, this group of men who were um, stargazers. They were kind of like priests in their own right. And their, their major function was to look at the stars and to kind of gain some kind of insight into history and into the future from the stars. Now, we would, of course, uh, you know, uh, run back in horror and say, well, how could something like this be in the Bible? So just hang on with me uh, before, we, before you react that way. Just understand that these were men probably from the area of Persia, way out in the east, about 18 or 1,900 miles from Jerusalem, who were stargazers, and uh, God is going to use them and use um, the stars, actually, to bring them to the Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. There's a good chance that these men knew something of the Bible. Why do I say that? Well, I say that for many reasons, but I think the main reason is because in the Bible we have men like Daniel and Esther and others that actually were living in this Persian culture and uh, would have probably shared things about the scriptures, writing scriptures, as a matter of fact, in the case of Daniel. For example, Daniel 9.25, written during the time that he was under uh, the auspices of the Persian Empire. He says, Don't Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and uh, build Jerusalem until Messiah the Prince, there shall be 70 weeks and 62, uh, seven weeks, 62 weeks, and the street shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. So there was some knowledge even in these distant people, these heathen distant people, of something about the Messiah. So that shouldn't all surprise us that they possibly had some idea that somebody, some Messiah, was going to come out of this Jewish nation. They didn't know who it was. They obviously didn't know much about any of the details, but they had probably this idea, this sense, that there was something that was going to happen uh, far to the West. And so um, it's no, no doubt in my mind that the, the Magi uh, one day just started to uh, see this strange instrument in the sky. Now, again, when, when it comes to the star, um, nobody agrees on what that is, and I'm not going to solve that problem here tonight. I think the thing you need to understand about the star is that it, it's real. There was some luminary, some light in the sky that was drawing them. I think it's also well to realize that, and we'll talk about this later, that it seems like only they could see it. In other words, there weren't a whole bunch of people like when Jesus comes back, seeing him from the east to the west. It seems like they were coming because they could see something uh, that nobody else could. And of course, if you, you, you read that because they come and they saw, they saw the star in the east. Well, Herod didn't see anything. And then later on, uh, the, the star came and went right over the place that Jesus was born. And it seems like they alone are following the star. It also seems like the star was intermittent. And that is to say that it came and then it went. You know, it came, they kind of saw the direction, they went to the direction, they end up in Jerusalem. Well, that's not exactly where they needed to be. They needed to be in Bethlehem, and so then they needed some further revelation to bring them to Bethlehem. Now, that's all speculation, but I think that the text at least leans in that direction. Nobody else but them could see it, that it was intermittent, but that there was some kind of star, luminary, some light in the sky that was drawing them. I like the proposition, and this again may not be true, that it was some angelic being. People have tried to say it was some kind of, uh, you know, uh, uh, coming together of several planets. It was a meteor or some other such uh, astronomical phenomena. That's possible, but I doubt it. Uh, others have said that they were like seeing a vision, that they didn't really see anything, but they had, I, I don't think I buy that one either. I think they saw something. And certainly God can create a light whenever God wants to create a light. I go back to the book of Numbers where God led the children of Israel by a pillar of fire all those many years. Uh, this seems to be in the same kind 
of context. So anyway, these are three Gentiles, or five Gentiles, I'm going to keep saying three, but as I said earlier, we don't know how many, that had seen this star and were now following it as they moved from east to west. Now, the important part of this text is not so much about the star and how many wise men there were, or magi. Oh, by the way, I I think it also bears a little bit of... um, just so you know, I'm not completely out to lunch about them probably knowing something about uh, uh, what might have been going on in Jewish scriptures. You've got the same word, uh, magi, or mag, actually, in uh, the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 39. I just want to read something for you. It's kind of interesting. I was doing a study on this. It says in um, Jeremiah 39.3, And this is in the context of Babylon, one of those countries in the east. In the ninth year of Zedekiah, king of Judah, in the tenth month, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and all of his army came against Jerusalem and besieged it. And it says in verse 2, in the eleventh year, and so on. Then verse 3, and then all the princes of the king of Babylon came in and sat in the middle gate. Nergal Sharezer, Shamgar Nebo, uh, Sarshechem Rabsaras, Nergal Sarezer, the Rab Mag. Now you see Rav Mag, M-A-G, is the word Magi. Rav simply means many or exalted. So um, uh, commentators think that this Rav Mag was a, was a specific function of some of the guys that surrounded Nebuchadnezzar and they were like these, um, these um, um, stargazers that, that kind of he used for Uh, leading and guiding him in his military battles and so on and so forth. It's also interesting that we get the word magician from Magi, but I don't think they were magicians per se. These were men, again, who had a sensitivity to uh, the stars, and uh, God is going to use that in a very uh, magnificent way. Now, the important part is not so much about Magi's and so on and so forth, uh, what they did, but that in the Bible we see over and over again the fact that God is going to call all the nations to himself. The Jews seem to have missed this in their, in their insulated view of the world. They, they thought that the gospel was only for them. But had they read their Bibles carefully, they would have seen that that is not in any sense the case. I've read Isaiah chapter 2. Isaiah is filled with uh, verses like this. So I'm talking about the mountain of the house of the Lord, and all the nations shall flow to it. Uh, uh, Isaiah chapter uh, 49 and verses 5 and 6 say this, And now the Lord says, Who formed me from the womb to be a spirit, to bring Jacob back to him, so that Israel is gathered to him. Indeed, is it a small thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones? In Israel, I will also give you as a light, that is the Jews, to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. Why, they missed it. They were to be the instrument to bring all the nations to the true and the living God, Jehovah, Yahweh. They didn't do it very well. Uh, And then chapter 60, in the same book, verses 1 through 3, Arise, shine, let your light come. And the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you. Listen, the Gentiles shall come to your light. Sounds like the Magi to me. And kings to the brightness of your rising. So the reason that this Magi story is here to show us That God is opening up salvation to all the nations right from the beginning of the birth of Messiah. This is the case. Now, if you know your Bible, you know that those couple verses are just the beginning. You remember the book of Ruth, where we have a Moabitess who's brought in to the covenant relationship of Israel. We, We have read the book of Jonah, and we know that during Jonah's Uh, disobedience that the sailors get saved and the Ninevites get saved. None of them were Jews. They are drawn in by God's mercy. Not by Jonah's mercy, but by God's mercy. In Numbers chapter 31, 
we see that God said, wipe out all the Midianites except for the virgins. And the virgins were brought in to the congregation of Israel. We see that in 1 Kings 17.8, the prophet Elijah was sent up to Zarephath, to a widow. And there she was brought in to sustain him. And his gift to her was being brought uh, into a covenant relationship with the Jewish God. And then, of course, we know that Simeon, as he's uh, later on in in the birth narrative, but found in Luke chapter 2, is... uh, Uh, holding the baby Jesus. And I don't know if you recall what Simeon said, but uh, let me uh, me read what he says in Luke chapter 2 and verse 32. It says this, And a light, he's talking about the baby that he's holding in his arms, he's a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. And I'm sure many people in the temple that they heard Simeon. But unfortunately, as you go through the New Testament, you see that many of the Jews didn't believe this at all. Well, what about Jesus? When Jesus comes into the, uh, his ministry, what, what do we find? Yes, he came to minister to those who are of the house of Israel, but not only them. We remember, of course, that he heals a centurion servant. A centurion is a Roman soldier. Remember, it was he going up uh, from uh, the south to the north, to Galilee, that it says he must needs go to Samaria. Why must he go to Samaria? Well, maybe it was the shortest route, but I think there's another reason he must go to Samaria, so that he would bump into a Samarian woman that needed to know the God of the Bible, the God of the Jews, the true and the living God. And we know the story in John 4 well, where Jesus tells her who he is, and she becomes a disciple. We also know, following the footsteps of Elijah, that Jesus goes up to the same area, and he goes up to a Syrophoenician woman, way, way above where Israel ended, and there he heals her daughter. Remember the lady that said, you know, even the dogs will eat the crumbs off the master's table, and with that little tiny faith that she had, Jesus drew her in to the covenant. And then, of course, the, 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 the grand capstone of it all is at the day of Pentecost, when you get, the, as I said earlier, the first sermon writ, uh, preached uh, by a man that has the Spirit dwelling in him, that is Peter. And we know that in the courtyard um, that day that there were many from all the different nations. You can read Acts chapter 2 on your own, Medes and Persians and Arabs and so on and so forth, and 3,000 get saved. You see, the point is, is that the Magi are emblematic, are showing us that God is calling all the nations to himself. So whoever you are today, I don't care um, (laughs) red or yellow, black or white, you are precious in his sight. God calls all the nations He is showing no favoritism to any nation whatsoever. Not Jews, not white people, not rich people, but all people. I just want you all to take comfort in that. You say, well, maybe I'm lopped out of the covenant because of my skin color or because of my economic standing or because of my intelligence or because of the family I was brought up in or because of my knowledge of the Bible or because of my sinful past. No, no, no. Never go there. This gospel is for everybody. Makes me want to weep when I read this. You got you got magi who would know nothing almost nothing about salvation in Jesus Christ being drawn by God to this baby's cradle who would be the baby that would save them from their sins. What's your story? I hope the story is you came to Jesus. That's the story I hope you have. And I want to tell you tonight, nothing should stop you. No barrier exists with God. The only barrier to Jesus exists with us. None with God. Do you believe that? We can go out tonight to anybody on that street or anybody in the richest section of town or go to Kenya or some other country or 
a homeless shelter, whatever, and be convinced that we can offer that same gospel to those people that Jesus is calling them to. So God is calling all the nations to himself extensively. But now, I think also in the text is the fact that God is revealing his truth to all the nations publicly and rationally. Now I want you to get this. Publicly and rationally. Why do I say this? I say this because as you read the story of the Magi, God is not focused on simply bringing Jesus into the world for a few people. And as we see, as the Bible moves forward from this point on, that the gospel will be, will be proclaimed publicly to the entire world and in a way that it makes absolute sense. Now, let me just give you some scriptures to say that God is revealing his truth publicly to all the nations. Yes, he's using the Jews. Yes, he's focused right here in the, on the Magi, but it's not ending with them. Psalm 111, verse 2, The works of the Lord are great, studied by all who have pleasure in them. Psalm 66, and verse 5, it says this, Come and see the works of God. It's an invitation. His, he is awesome in his doing towards the Son of Men. And then back of uh, a page to Psalm 64 and verse 9. Men shall fear and shall declare the work of God, for they shall wisely consider his doing. Now there are two ways in our text, I think, that we see that God is publicly proclaiming his Son to all the nations. The first, I think, is through the Holy Word of God, or what we call the Bible or the Scriptures. Now, I want you to know, again, what I said earlier, was I think the Bible was in some way or another, at least some of the books of the Bible were known to some of these pagan nations, simply because the Jews had been scattered, they'd been in many of these nations before. But I also want you to recognize that these, uh, these magi, these wise men, come into Jerusalem, and they stop off and uh, somehow gain an audience with Herod and say, we've seen the star, and uh, I think it's the king of the Jews being born here someplace soon. And what does Herod do immediately? Does he say, oh, that's just esoteric, hidden knowledge. We don't know anything about that stuff. You guys just go on home. No, what he does is he gathers the scribes of the day and the experts on the law, and they open up the word of God. And the word of God is clear in Micah chapter 5 and verse 2 that this Messiah, that this king was to be born in Bethlehem. It's a public book. It's a public proclamation. We don't have a book that's hidden. We don't have a book that we have you know, tucked away when only we have our secret meetings so that we can have our secret little doctrines among our secret little selves and want nobody else to know what we're doing. I am unabashedly and unashamedly telling you that this book is public and it is, um, it, it is accessible to anybody who wants to read it. That's why we give Bibles out. Because we're not ashamed of this book. We're not ashamed to say that this is a public announcement to all the nations. Well, that's exactly what Herod figures out. And of course, we know that throughout this uh, rendition of Matthew that he's often quoting uh, the Old Testament. He says in chapter 1, verse 23, quotes Isaiah 9, 6. Later on in the very same chapter, in uh, verse 18, he talks about Rachel weeping, which comes out of Jeremiah 31, verse 15. They're continually quoting a public book because God is not trying to hide his message and just give it to a few select people here and there. 
don't know if you've ever noticed this, but all the cults have this in common. They like to have their secret little doctrines among themselves. Secret meetings over here. Secret uh, visions of God. Secret understanding. We call that Gnosticism. They have the key to God and nobody else has it. We're not that way. Christians have never been that way. Well, they're not supposed to be that way anyway. We are to say to the world, come and look. Come and read. Come and see. The question is, are we doing that? And do we do it well? Well, are we doing it? Might be yes. Are we doing it well? Probably not, because I know I don't do it well. But God is not the one that's preventing us. God is not ashamed of his book. Maybe sometimes we are. We notice that we go to the book of Acts and go through the ministry of Jesus and the apostles. What, what's, what's going on here? What's going on? Jesus isn't hiding out in a cave, assembling 12 men with him, hiding from the world. It says he walked around Palestine doing what was good. I mean, he was so vulnerable, they could have killed him at any time. Had it not been for the protective hand of God, Jesus would have been killed 50 times over. He wasn't afraid to tell them who he was and what his salvation is. You get to the apostles and you see the exact same thing. Peter and John are in the courtyard, Acts 4, Acts 3, and they're proclaiming Jesus publicly. They're getting rebuffed, they're getting mocked, ridiculed, they're getting charged, they're being thrown into prison. But they are not afraid to give out this truth publicly. I love it what the Apostle Paul says. And again, you probably know the text. But I just want you to be aware of it. And that would be when he's standing before uh, King Agrippa. And he's defending the faith and so on and so so forth. Uh, He says in Acts chapter 26... Uh, verse, uh, I'll go back to verse 24. Paul sitting before Agrippa, and he's also there with um, um, uh, Festus. Now, as he thus made his defense, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, you are beside yourself. Much learning is driving you mad. But he said, I'm not mad, most noble Festus, but, but speak the words of truth, and get this, and reason. For the king, before whom I also speak freely, that's Agrippa, knows these things, for I am convinced that none of these things escapes his attention. Listen, since this thing was not done in a corner, you want to accuse me of believing the Bible and of proclaiming Jesus as the Messiah? you got all the evidence in the world. I'm guilty, because that's exactly what I've done, and I will continue to do it. Christianity is never to be done in a corner. Christianity goes into the marketplace of ideas and says, listen to what we have to say. And guess what? We have the right worldview. And that leads me to it's also very rational. I get so tired of people saying that Christianity is just mysticism. You just got to believe a lot of mystical things. Yes, there's There are things that we can't explain. Yes, there's paradoxes. But let me tell you something. This book is wholly consistent to itself. You find me a hole in this Bible, then I'll abandon the faith forever. No, this book actually is a consistent worldview, the only worldview that reflects the way things are. It talks about man's sin. Why are we the way we are? Why is the nightly news the way it is? It tells us our one need is forgiveness of sins, which we cannot gain within ourselves. It tells us of God taking care of that problem and sending his son down to die, becoming both God and man, necessary both, because he needed to have a divine righteousness, but he also needed to touch us as men to know who we are and to identify with us, going on that cross as a man, the God-man. And then, of course, rising again the third day, showing that he had defeated death. And then through believing in all these events of the gospel, we come to know Christ as our Savior. And God forgives us of all of our sins. And now begins that long, tedious journey of being conformed into the image of Christ. And we still have that old man raging up, but the new man is in there. And he's striving to love God. And finally, God coming back in Christ at the second coming 
And then we will be completely whole and we will go to be with Jesus forever. There is nothing in this Bible that can't be understood even by a little child. And that's what I love about it. Yes, there are some difficult things in it. But no, there are not things so difficult that anybody that's, that's, that's of a rational age cannot understand these words and come to know Jesus Christ. That takes everybody... No, 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 nobody's off the hook here tonight. I'm not smart enough to know the Bible. Baloney. You're all smart enough to know the Bible. You're all smart enough to understand the basic tenets of salvation. The wise men got it. You can get it. And so God reveals his truth publicly and rationally. That's why we have men called apologists. An apologist is somebody, simply somebody that goes into the, uh, the, uh, the, 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 the uh, domain of public I- ideas and defends Christianity. Now, that's not going to save anybody. But the fact of the matter is, when somebody defends Christianity, they sound absolutely coherent in what they're saying. Because it's a coherent system. I'm sure there have been times in your life when you may have doubted that. I'm sure we've all gone through periods. Is, is this really real? But when you start to review the elements of the Christian message, you begin to know that this is the only consistent, coherent worldview that there ever has been. And the reason for that is simple, is because it's come from the hand of God. You know, there's rural views all over the place. You look at any other discipline, whether it be psychology or politics or, or entertainment or, or whatever, they have their, they, in philosophy, they got their world views, but every one of them are pockmarked with holes. This one's not. Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't understand everything, that's fine. Neither do I. But believe what's clear. And what's clear is that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. You're a sinner. He came to die on the cross to take your place and die for your sins. And he rose again from the dead to prove that he had carried our sins away. And trusting in him will will bring you to glory and communion with God forever and ever. God reveals his truth publicly and rationally. And of course, Herod got that. See, Herod wasn't saying, "Ah, I don't believe the Bible. What's the stuff about Bethlehem? No, Herod, even an unbelieving, wicked king said, Whoa, it's right here in the Bible where he's going to be born. Go there and let me know so I can come and worship him. Well, of course, we know that Herod had no interest in worshiping Jesus. He wanted to kill Jesus. The fact of the matter is, it was public. God wasn't hiding it from Herod. He's not hiding it from unbelievers. What keeps people from Jesus Christ is them. Twenty-six years without Jesus for me. What am I going to do? Say, ah, well, God didn't. God didn't elect me. Or God didn't pull me in, or whatever. No, that might be true. And. Back here in the eternal counsels of God. The point is, I rejected Jesus. It's on me. And so it's true of your relatives, your friends, your neighbors, your co-workers, anybody you know that doesn't have him. We are here to proclaim publicly and rationally the message of Jesus Christ. Thirdly, I want you to see how he calls his magi. This This is fascinating to me. God calls his people out of the nations. And I find four ways, at least in the text, and there's probably more, four ways that God calls people, invites people, calls people to himself. The first is he does it humanly. Now, I want you to understand this. These men are stargazers. These men are not believers at this point. These men are anything but Christian. They're into stars and astrology 
and all the stuff that we hate. But does God just say, oh, I'm going to cut these guys off. They have nothing in common with the Jews. Let them go to hell. No. What he does is he uses something that they understand to begin to draw them in to his covenant people. I, I was blown away when I meditated on this. See, we often think, well... If somebody has nothing to do with God, uh, there's nothing I can have possibly in common with them, and I'll just let them go. Boy, thank God they didn't do that with me. You know, when I got saved, you know what it was that that drew me in? Something very human. I I wanted to have something to live for. I was all over the place. That's a very human thing. Everybody wants to have something to live for. There isn't a human being alive that doesn't want that. There's not a human being alive that doesn't want peace. There's not a human being alive that doesn't want joy. There are things common to humanity that everybody wants. And God will often condescend to those things that, 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 uh, that are our needs. are very human and he connects with them. He's connecting with these magi based on the stars. Because that's what they know. How do you reach an athlete? Talk sports. Bring sports into the Bible. Especially wrestling, not basketball. No, just kidding. (laughs) Basketball and wrestling. And any other sport. If that'll help build a bridge. That'll help connect, because that's what they know. The Bible has a lot to say about this stuff. You know, what, 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 do, you, what do you do with uh, uh, people who make families their idols? You talk to them about family. You talk to people about a variety of things where they're at. I wrote that book years ago uh, for the coach drive, Wise Words of Sports or something, whatever it's called, Joe. And what I just tried to do there was use some biblical words and connect it with sports. It's not very good, but there was an attempt there to do that. And God in here is using something very, very human that these men would have understood. To draw them in. Now, are they going to walk away saying, I believe in Jesus, I still believe in the stars? No. Because they're going to see the error of their ways. But there is a right way to use some very human things to bring people into faith or draw them into your life so they can see the light. Otherwise, they want nothing to do with you. We had that in Acts 17. You know, Paul understood the Greek poets. He understood Greek philosophy. He was trained in this stuff. Does he go up to these boneheads and say, you guys know nothing to believe in Jesus or go to hell. He doesn't do that. He quotes their poets. And then he sees a marker to the unknown God. And instead of just completely dissing it or saying, well, wow, idolatry, I can't hardly stand that. He says, guess what? That that monument over there? Let me tell you who that unknown God is. And it opened up the door to the gospel. Now, not too many of them believed. I get that. But Paul wasn't just, uh, you know, disavowing any connection at all with these guys. How do you deal with a philosopher? Know some philosophy for crying out loud. How do you deal with a guy that loves politics? Know something about politics. Find ways to connect with people. He used stars to draw these guys in. God calls people secretly. Now, I'm not contradicting myself. The invitation is to all. The general call is to all the world. But when God is calling somebody to faith, it's done secretly. That is, others won't necessarily know that you're being called to God because The invitation being public, the general call is public, but the actual drawing in of sinners to God is done between God and the sinner. How do I know that? Because of the star. The star was given to them. The star was there, a revelation to them. They could see the star. God was drawing these men to the manger. He wasn't drawing 
everybody in Persia to the manger. Now everybody in Persia may have access to the the public ministry of the scriptures and to the rational coherence of the word of God. But only these men saw the stars and went that we know about, at least at this point in history. Uh, what, What about you? Wasn't there a time in your life that all of a sudden you started thinking about the things of God? Maybe you're brought up in a Christian home and you kind of believed all that stuff anyway, but there was that day or that moment or that period or that month where suddenly this stuff really started to mean something to you. Or maybe you were brought up in a Christian home and suddenly, like me being an atheist, all of a sudden you're thinking, huh, there must be a God. doesn't make any sense if there is no God. How can all this stuff be if there's no God? And, and you start to have a quest and you feel yourself being drawn in to something. You don't even know what it is. That's exactly what's going on there. They don't know what what exactly they're going to run into. They just know there's a star and it might be the king of the Jews and and they want to be part of this. He does it secretly. I don't know how many times it's been that you you, you work with somebody and and, you're giving them the gospel and, and then there's somebody over here to the side that you didn't even know about that's watching everything that's happening and they're being drawn in you're focusing here and God's focusing here. It's happened to me many, many times. Because God's the one that draws. God draws people to his son. And he does it in a way, sometimes it takes the glory completely away from we, the instrument. Maybe someone tonight that I don't even know about is hearing this and is being drawn to Jesus Christ. Maybe they're scared to tell their friends or neighbors about what God's doing in their life. And I get that. But I'm praying tonight, if if you're not a believer, that Jesus Christ is drawing you to himself. And you're starting to ask questions about who Christ is and what is salvation. And who am I? And all those questions. Thirdly, supernaturally. Well, I think you would agree that no one ever comes to Jesus Christ naturally. John 1.13 says we're, not, we're born not of blood or the will of the flesh or the will of man, but of God. God calls in a supernatural way that transcends or that's over beyond anything we can possibly understand. He's drawn these, these wise men, these magi to himself. That's, that's unbelievable. I couldn't have done that. You could have talked for months and years to these guys. Wouldn't have done them a bit of good. But Jesus, or God, when he calls people, calls them supernaturally in a way that we don't understand. That's why Paul says the gospel is the power of God and the salvation. So it's not me, it's not the messenger that's the power, it's not my methodology that's the power, it's not how well I have articulated it that's the power, it's not my energy that's the power, it's not my giftedness giftedness that's the power, it's the gospel draws them in. And it's God that uses the gospel to draw them. We have the privilege at times of being an instrument in all that. But it's God who supernaturally draws sinners to himself. So he draws uh, these men humanly, secretly, supernaturally, and of course, efficaciously. Efficaciously is a fancy word for powerfully. When God draws somebody to himself, man, woman, black, white, yellow, green, whatever, once he starts, he finishes. This is one of the great comforts. Because if someone is starting to come to Christ, is starting to to see him, their heart's being changed, is being regenerated, God doesn't like truncate that or stop it in the middle and say, ah, no, I think I made a mistake with you. Forget it. I'm not going to call you anymore. He doesn't do that. For all that he calls, he also justifies. And them he justifies, he also 
glorifies. What shall we say to these things? If God is for us, and in the context, the for us is the calling. All things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called. When God calls you, nobody can stop it. Not even you. He that begun a good work in us. Philippians 1.6. Being confident of this very thing. He that has begun a good work in you will perform it to the day of Christ. Maybe tonight somebody's saying, yeah, I'm, I'm moving towards God. I don't quite understand it. Why am, I, why am I asking questions about God? Why am I feeling a sensitivity to Christ? Why do I feel my sin? Why do I, why do I, why do I, why do I? And, and, and guess what? God's calling you. Just come. When God's calling, come. Come unto me, all you who labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. So when God calls his people out of the nations, he calls them humanly, secretly, supernaturally, and efficaciously. So what's the story of the Magi? There's many different applications to the story. But one I think is definitely right is that God is showing us that he's calling the nations to himself, right to the manger. And he's calling all the nations. He's calling it through the public work of his word and of the consistent Christian message. He's giving it to everybody. And then in that, he's calling a people of every tribe and kindred and nation unto himself. And so I want to encourage encourage you tonight and comfort you. You don't have to be a Jew. You don't have to be smart. You don't have to be white. You don't have to be a man. You don't have to be talented. You don't have to be gifted. You don't even have to play guitar. You simply have to obey the call of God in your life. Will you take a lesson from the Magi who came 1,800 miles away to find the baby? And for you tonight, it's not 1,800 miles. Deuteronomy 30. The word is hid here with you. In your heart. Now if you will confess the Lord Jesus Christ. And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. You will be saved. It's that close. God is not hiding. God wants people to know him. As the Magi did. Father, thank you for this Christmas story, if you will. I think about, Lord, when you saved me, I could echo with Paul, I'm the least of all the saints. Why? I don't know. Why am I a Christian? Why am I standing up here preaching? I don't know. But I know you called me in your grace. And you revealed your son in me and you showed me who he is. And I came a marching to Jesus. Little did I know that you were pulling me with your gracious hands all the while. May your gracious hands reach out to this church, to this community, to this great city. And may you draw many, many, many sinners to yourself. 